everyone. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Mid American Gardener. I'm your host, Tanisha Spain, and joining me are three of our veteran panelists ready to answer your questions and show you some of the things that they brought from their garden. So let's have them introduce themselves and tell you a little bit more about their specialty. So John, we'll start with you. I am uh, John Bodensteider. I'm uh, a Vermaine County Master Gardener. I live up by uh, Bismarck, uh, just north of Danville. And I like uh, pasta is one of as one of my passions, and I've got about <laughs> 200 varieties. And I like shade plants because I have a lot of trees, and got to go pick cherries today. So, um, but just a little bit of everything in my yard. A little bit of everything. Okay, Marty. Hi, my name is Marty Alanya. I'm a retired landscaper with a large black dog in my background there, and. Um, <laughs> And uh, um, perennials and uh, landscaping for for the home garden is probably my my specialty. All I right, do garden, very nice. Okay, and Jen. Hi, I'm Jen Nelson. I am a horticulturalist, and you can find me online at groundedandgrowing.com. And like Marty and John, there's a little bit of everything in my yard too. Probably a little bit too much, if you ask my husband. Uh, but I don't think there's such a thing as too many plants. Um, I was going to say, you're among friends. Uh, yeah, that I'm one, good. So we're or not going to argue. <laughs> right. Or enablers, depending on your definition. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like John was just saying, he accidentally bought 30 hostas yesterday. You know, it happens. It I happens. You have to so. <laughs> okay. So we've got show and tells. Uh, John, we'll start with you. What'd you bring us? Okay. I have the first thing. I have is something I was up in North Dakota and they have um, a forest forest area up there that you can buy um, shrubs and trees of all kinds. So I've been wanting more of these. This is uh, Saskatoon. Uh, they are like a blueberry. We call them June berries up there. They are in the Amalacker uh, family. That's the Anifolia. Mm -hmm. They are um, um, a perennial uh, I find that the berries are smaller than the, the the blueberries from Michigan and others, but they are so much more intense flavor that it's well worth. The nice thing with these is you don't have to worry about the soil uh, pH. They will just about grow anywhere. They like, they're an edge plant, so they don't need full, full sun. Um, and they will, um, they just, they grow to about, oh, if you let them, they'll grow to 10, 15 feet tall, but you can keep them around 10 feet or eight feet so that they're easy picking. They're very fly, pliable. They have a beautiful fall color. The leaves turn a scarlet red and um, they first turn yellow and then just a, a, a brilliant red. So um, you can get them up there. They're only a dollar a tree. For if you go to the Forest Service, and, and they they were out of them, but somebody canceled, so I was able to get fifty of them. So, um, so, now I've so got John, when the well, do they look like blueberries? Does does the fruit look like a blueberry? Yes, yes. And then the other question I was going to ask is when you um, so you're going to plant those this summer, this fall. When do you? Plant I'm, I'm going to plant them this week. Okay, and so when will you get your first harvest next year? Uh, I wait three years. If I if years. I get if I get berries on them, I will actually pick them off, and so that it sends a lot of the uh, uh, energy to the roots because that's what I really want. I want I'm my main concern. Anytime you plant any fruit tree or berry tree, you should really wait three years before you harvest anything pick it off, just throw it away. It hurts. Oh, it hurts. And, uh, but <laughs> if, you want, too. if you want a good, a long lasting plant, uh, these, uh, you, you've got to do that just to give the plant because it's putting all its energy into producing that fruit and seeds rather than, than going into, into the, into the roots. And that's, that's what's critical those first three years. And it's very critical of those first three years that you really watch your moisture so that those roots, because the roots are minimal, they've got to work into the surrounding soil and get that, get those nutrients, those capillary uh, roots and get established. And once that happens, uh, then you don't have to wa water them anymore. But that those first year, the first three years, first year especially is 
just so, so important. But uh, that's, you know, awesome. one of the things that I've, I've been wanting, we grow them up on our farm. They grow wild all over up there on our farm. And, and we used to pick gallons and gallons of them and they make the best pie and jam and, and uh, uh, pancake syrup. Okay, so 2024, pencil me in. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, Marty, we're going to you. This is in your wheelhouse. Uh, question number 37, DJ. Um, this is from Linda. She writes in, she recently moved to a new building that has a hedge in front with a big gaping bear area. Is there a way to bring some growth back here? And she sent a picture in um, for us to see it, but you could see where it is just wide open there. So I'm sure you've had this question a time or two in, in your years uh, <laughs> helping folks. So what are your thoughts? Uh, the short answer is no. <laughs> no. Oh. At the bottom of that, that's a Japanese yew. And once you cut back into the canopy where it's dead, there is a tiny, tiny chance that if you took the whole top off, you might get some new growth in, in an empty canopy. But like taking that, taking that clear off, the problem here is that the plant is too large for where it's at. So they have to keep planting it they have to keep cutting it back and cutting it back and keeping it off the sidewalk. As you can see, it's a little narrow sidewalk in the picture. I'm assuming you see that. So what I would recommend is to take those out completely, or at least the one that's dead and replace it with um, not even another you maybe. I mean, maybe it's time for those biggest ones to go away and do something that's more suitable for that space. Those yous are never going to stop getting bigger. So let me ask you this is from as a lay person who would look at this and try to problem solve. What if you mm -hmm. cut in like a big slice off to where it was healthy? Is that an option? Well, it, evergreens have a, and most other plants too, but evergreens particularly have a canopy. You see down underneath there where it's bare, mm -hmm. there's no sun getting there. That's why it's bare underneath. The, the canopy on the top part, the growth part, shades the inside and nothing will grow in there because it doesn't get any sun. So once that wood gets to a certain age, it's just not going to sprout out again. Um, you're, you're better. Here, here's a tip. Read the label. <laughs> <laughs> plant. Read the label and see how big the plant is going to get. And if it says it's going to get four feet wide at maturity, just add another foot and think about if you really, really can use it because mm -hmm. you can't in a three and a half foot space. Don't think to yourself, we can keep cutting this back. Why would you do that? Why? Mm -hmm. There's it's a, a constant place. battle. You'll be fighting yeah. it forever. Yeah. And sure. I would, I would suggest too that she, um, whoever plants that, if, if it's growing like that, if it's really growing, what you need to do is annually or even biannually, trimming that so that you don't get that real dead zone in the middle. Uh, because if you yeah. take that outside uh, trim off of all the way around that bush, the whole underneath is all dead. So you yeah. only have that much really life. And, um, yeah. and so it's very important that you keep it to the size or a little bit smaller than the, the largest size you want. Otherwise, yeah. you're end up with spots like that. Like, Yeah. Okay. But you know, there are just, there are, um, I think the industry term is a hillion gazillion other plants that might be able to live mm -hmm. in that space between the building and the sidewalk. I would definitely look into those. And P.S., not something with thorns on it next to the sidewalk. I'm just saying. <laughs> All right. So she's got... <laughs> Linda's got some uh, some suggestions there. Like like she said, she just moved into the building and this guy was here, so she's looking for advice. So hopefully she's yeah. not emotionally attached to it and can and can try to find something else that can go there. Uh, she okay. she needs a new friend. A, a new, new friend. New friend yes. for a new start. All right, thank um, you. Sorry. Okay, Jen, you've got a show and tell for us. What'd you bring? I do. This is a fun plant called a sensitive plant. And um, we found this at a local garden center, sort of local. We had to drive a little way. But here's its fun, fun feature. If I can get it to, to behave on television. If I touch the leaves, I don't know if you can see that. They close up. I do. You can see it. You can mm -hmm. see it as, as you do it. Oh, wow. 
So yeah. uh, it's very fun for kids. It's fun for adults too. Um, I, that's all I would get done all day. That's it. <laughs> right. That and the dogs. That's it. <laughs> that and the dogs. Yes. So but, uh, why does it do that, Jen? What is the? It's really, really interesting and complex if you start looking into how it works it has um a structure a set of cells at the this is technically the leaf this whole thing that looks kind of like a mm -hmm. palmate and these are leaflets so at the base of each leaflet and at the base of each leaf there's a a structure of cell structure of cells that uh, conducts electricity to the plants conducts charges and so it controls how the water is distributed in the plant. And it's sensitive to shaking. If I shake the whole plant, like if it's windy or um, change the temperature really drastically, it will shut it down. And it lasts for a few minutes and it costs the plant energy to do this. So they think that it probably has some sort of advantage in the wild, but they're not exactly sure what, whether it's con con probably conservation of, um, water or maybe they said even avoiding predators because any kind of rabbit or whatever would be kind of freaked out by a plant that moves on its own. <laughs> um, but uh, it takes um, energy. So you don't want to just be doing this all the time. It will stress the plant out to the point that it may not be able to recover. But, um, and actually this is considered a weed in uh, warmer parts of the United States and like Central and South America. So there's probably some viewer somewhere that's looking at me thinking that- yeah, rolling their eyes. Now. <laughs> uh, so but, do you keep it inside as a house plant or do you have it outside in the- We're gonna try. We just bought them uh, a couple of weeks ago. We found them and the kids of course were like, oh my gosh, this is so, this is so fun. So we'll see. We'll see how it does. It has a little pink flower on it, and it is pretty cute. <laughs> we'll see what how it does. And you know, weed a weed is only an opportunistic plant, as one of my advisors told me years ago. So <laughs> a survivor. That is pretty cool, though. I would love to see. So it curls in. It curls in. Yeah, it all yeah. cool. It's like the leaf that's all close together, and yeah. it all folds down. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Well, thank you. It's the fainting goat of the plant life. It is, yeah. isn't yeah. it? Yeah. 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 Please yeah. don't. <laughs> okay, John, we are back around to you with another show and tell. Okay. Um, this I started from a cutting. This is a laurel bay tree. Oh. Ooh. And I, I love it because I do a lot of soups. And I can't think of one of my soups that I don't grow it in. And you can see it's getting a lot of new growth all of a sudden. It was at the greenhouse, but I brought it home and it's, uh, I, I fertilized it now that it's summertime. Uh, most of the time you don't want to fertilize your plants during the winter. Uh, they're under stress because they're not getting enough sun, but you can see the nice new growth coming on it. Mm -hmm. And this mm -hmm. is, gives you a, a complete, use the fresh leaves. It's, it's a totally different, uh, taste than what you do is if you pick them and let them dry they still look about the same they're these are darker green once they dry they're more olive green but uh, it's a mediterranean plant and um, um, it uh, it's, it's laurel uh, laurel nobilis is, is is actually the the botanical name but it's mm -hmm. I, I just call it my bay, bay leaf tree and um, I remember well, Chuck made a simple syrup on a show uh, pre-pandemic, and it was delicious. Mm -hmm. Is that from the same? Correct. And, wow. and, it, and And he was comparing, I think if I remember right, he said that the taste from the fresh leaves was completely different mm -hmm. than the, the, the leaves you buy at the grocery store. And one more question, Kay Carnes, she's another one of our big herbalists on the show. She um, brought a, a very small bay and she said it takes like two years to be able to get one to produce leaves that you can use. Um, so uh, yeah. where did you start? This is a cutting from another plant that I had. We had one out at the, um, at the veterans uh, greenhouse and I took a cutting and that was about five years ago. So this tree here right now is about five years old. So it truly and does take that long. It does. Wow. They are very slow growing. They are they are a tender perennial, so you can't leave it outside. 
Uh, it's like I say, it's a, it's a native to the Mediterranean area, but it's 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 well worth my effort. And it it you know if you have a sunny uh, place in the house, uh, you can keep it. Uh, it does not like wet feet. I I do know that. I I ha I've taken a couple cuttings of this, and one time. Uh, we forgot about it and had it in the wet bed too long. It just, it just rotted. Mm. So okay. uh, anybody even else, the adult, I... even the adult does not like, it likes well-drained. So make sure if you get one that you put it in a, a in a pot with well-drained soil. John, do you use any particular type of fertilizer or fertilizer schedule? Cause I have I one. Water soluble. Okay. And I, I usually on something like this, I'll, I'll, fertilize it once a month. Now on my petunias and things like that, that require heavy feeding, I'll do that then once uh, a, a week. Okay. But yeah, the petunias and, and uh, you know, mm -hmm. your, your, all those, that, the, all your specialty flowers that you get that look so nice at the greenhouse and you take them home and all of a sudden they, they, they wilt and die. It's because they need some for their heavy, heavy, heavy feeders. <laughs> And, um, and you need to deadhead petunias, especially the larger ones. Okay. I have a bay tree that's about the same age as yours and it's just not doing really anything. I'm wondering if I'm watering it too much. I'm, yeah, it, they do not, like I say, they, they like to dry out there from the Mediterranean. So that's a, an area that is mm. hot and dry. And uh, uh, I do know that they, um, you don't need to water them a lot. In fact, they, they discourage from, I'd say if, if you water it every other week, that's probably enough. Even in the summer. Huh? Yeah. Wow. Interesting. Unless, the soil, unless, you know, I've got mine in a plastic pot. If you would have it in a ceramic pot, or not a ceramic, but a, a terracotta pot mm -hmm. or a, you know, a fabric pot, yeah. then it's going to dry out. Then you're going to need to water it more, but in a plastic pot, and I've got mulch on top of that too, so. Oh, wow. Well, I've got some new summer goals now. So Here I've we got go. have my uh, bay tree. Even the uh, experts like, are learning I like things. making soups. Yeah. And I like making soups. And I, for that, I do like the dried leaves, that, that flavor better. Go ahead, Marty. John, do these plants get to like tree size? Yes. There, let them. There is? Right. And do they bloom with a tiny fragrant flower it's a very very insignificant flower but they're never very really, fragrant yeah is it i've never really gone up and I, i've never you know the one we had at, at the at the VA greenhouse was was very large we had it in the we, corner and it was one of those a, places we forgot and and it just thrived wow we had a chance to go to italy a few years ago and i couldn't figure out what the fragrance was in the air but bay is grown there as a hedge Mm -hmm. And allowed to grow a large enough to be a shade tree. Yeah. And I, yeah. one of our Airbnb hosts, his brother was a horticulture student. So he and I sat and talked a lot. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> what the plant was. And I'm like, I had no idea what this was, but it smells delicious. Yeah. Of course, it's tiny flowers, but there's a hillion, gazillion of the industry term again. Yes. So. yes. And they right. are hard to find. They are hard to find at the nurseries. Yeah. But if you find one, but then right. if you, and then if you have a greenhouse, you can always, or a wet bed, you can try cutting in and making your own, so. All right, thank you, John. All right, Marty, we're to you. Uh, DJ, we're gonna do number 39. This is from Linda Miner. She writes in, like the rest of us, time got past me and I did not get my sage harvested before it bloomed. I read that the leaves become bitter if nothing is harvested before it flowers. Although I'm loving the pop of purple in my herb garden, how should I proceed with care in order to get a harvest this summer? So Marty, what are your thoughts there? Uh, my thoughts, and I certainly these these two other panelists can chime in on here. Um, it's it's only June. So got the plant back, and when the new growth comes on, harvest those. That's what I did. And and I did, let mine go to bloom because it is a beautiful, beautiful ornamental plant. It's really pretty in the garden. And the butterflies um, and the bees love it. Oh yeah. It's a little, it'll, it's a little multiple flower, you know, it's, um, it's like a salvia almost yep. and just adore it. You know, same family, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, that it's very attractive to butterflies and pollinators. 
but it keeps growing, you know, so wait till the new growth or you can shear off the flowers and harvest the, the new growth leaves and you're fine. Oh, look at that. Crisis averted. And anytime, have, you have, anytime you have an herb that goes to flower, you're going to usually not like the leaves as much as if you pick them before they go to flower. So if you can, like the lady said, she didn't have time, but I mm -hmm. usually like to deadhead mine before they even, if I see them budding out, I discard them, just snip them off. And that yeah. way you're going to get more intense flavor in your leaves. And I, would, and I have to go, I have to deadhead my oregano. I noticed was putting up some. When the show <laughs> <laughs> Jen, you were going to say well, something. I would also say, go ahead and try it and see if it, even though the book or whatever says that it's going to be bitter and uh, try it and see, yeah. you may, yeah. you may not find it bitter at all. And then, Hey, there's no crisis at all. So, but, uh, but also cut it back. And um, like John yeah. and uh, Marty said, I use, uh, sage in my garden for its ornamental qualities. It looks really nice in my flowers and it also is in my herb garden as well. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, uh, question number 41. This is for Jen. So she might not be on the show much longer now that she's arrived as a real celebrity. Um, right. but this is for her. It says <laughs> Jennifer Nelson asked for some viewer comments on birds we've seen at our Oriole feeders. I do see finches on a regular basis as well as cat birds. That's my favorite bird. This past week, I saw a downy woodpecker on my hummingbird feeder, which was a first. It appeared to be drinking the nectar and spent a long time there. I'm located in Logan County. So Jen, your adoring fans would like to know more about <laughs> what birds you've seen. Hello. And, uh, Hello. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna have to wear a disguise now. Tell us, at the grocery tell us store. Queen Jen, please. Yes, yeah. Part your wisdom. All right. <laughs> now you can follow me a lot around your local Walmart and ask. Me <laughs> so, did you see? We, any we know, Jen. We know. We have a network out following your every move. Oh yes, paparazzi is notified. Right. But did you see any um, any different birds? Any birds you hadn't seen before this spring? I've never seen the woodpecker on the hummingbird. That's Peter, that's a new one on me. Uh, but we saw a different woodpecker that we've never seen before, and it scared the bejesus out of us. We were eating outside, and we heard this big caca sort of call, and we looked towards the house, towards our bird feeders, and we had a, a pileated woodpecker on our uh, suet feeder. That sucker is as big as a chicken. And it's wow. huge. And it's well, and we've talked about, I've seen them, I live in Monticello, and I've seen them at a couple of the big wooded parks around town, and my kids watch Woody Woodpecker, so we talk about that it's the woodpecker that they base Woody Woodpecker on, and the kids were really disappointed when we finally saw it, because they said he wasn't blue, and he, and he didn't talk. So. Darn it, cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> it was really <laughs> in our yard and it was so like stopped us all like mid bite as we we're eating dinner because it was so huge what about you guys any um i did any, have a downy unusual woodpecker. bird sightings i did have a downy woodpecker at my hummingbird feeder and it sat there and i could see it it tried pecking but then it just went down and you could actually see its tongue almost, it looked like its tongue going down in and licking oh wow <laughs> they're evolving <laughs> oh and i've i've also had the baltimore <laughs> orioles hmm. Marty, what about you? Are you a birder? Uh, just just about half. When I when I notice woodpeckers, they're way up in the in the eighty foot tall hackberries on my neighbor's yard. <laughs> it's like uh oh, they're making a hole. Um, no, uh, but I, I see a lot of them because I have a lot of I have a lot of cover here. I'm looking out my window as as we're sitting here, and I do have a pretty good variety, mind you, not like the other two panelists, but still. And I have, I have feeders all around. Um, I just, I have the normal ones, but I, I hear woodpeckers and we have owls out here too. Ooh. Well, because, you know, hackberries get so big and then they do get hollow spots in them. And there's a, I can't, I have never been able to spot this owl, but I look for him and I hear him almost every night. I love, I love hearing owls. When I was a kid, there were nightingales in Southern Illinois I would hear at night. That was nice. Somebody's got birds. I just heard that. <laughs> they just made an appearance. Yeah. Um, we've I've got had, about I've two had, minutes left. This and winter, I, I had seven different types of woodpeckers at my suet feeders and other feeders. Wow. Oh, brother. 
Nice, nice. I wanted to They ask are fun you guys. to see. Um, let's see. Kelly, a couple of weeks ago, said that she she's in Bloomington, McLean County, and said that she had been seeing monarchs. Any monarch sightings for you? I have not seen any um, in Vermilion County. Uh, Marty, Jen, John, what about you guys? Not yet. Not yet. I had two early, uh, probably almost three weeks ago, and I haven't seen any since. But I don't have any cicadas up here either. Got to see I'm drowning in cicadas at my house. <laughs> I haven't, I, I haven't seen many either. And um, the there's all sorts of cultivated and non-cultivated milkweed <laughs> Mm hmm on my house. We have, we live near a railroad track, so it's all up down the railroad track. I bother planting it here. Why would I do that? I've been monitoring my God's got his own thing going there. So uh, I've been monitoring my milkweed and there's nothing. Uh there are yeah, you nothing know spring eaten. flower now. So yeah, I've been looking for eggs, and so I guess we'll just have to continue to Yeah, to keep yeah. an eye out for those. we had that early that late frost, and so Mm that may have delayed them coming up. I don't, you know, it's Yeah. Hopefully in the coming days or weeks, we'll see them. So, yeah. all right, guys, we have run out of time. So thank you so much for your time and talents. Thank you for watching. If you have a question for our panelists about insects or flowers, veggies, anything, you can find us on Gmail at yourgarden at gmail.com. And as always, you can look us up on Facebook and Instagram and drop us your question there. And we will see you next time. Good night.